Good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome. We are excited to offer today's presentation, a panel discussion for social work students, BSW and MSW, who are interested in higher education and uh, obtaining a doctorate. So thank you for joining. Our agenda for today, uh, we're going to do an introduction of what Phi Alpha is. Um, we will then introduce the panelists. Uh, we will have a panel discussion that will last for about an hour. We have structured questions that we will ask and they will respond to. Um, once that closes, we will then open it up for participant question and answer. Um, but if you have questions throughout this uh, panel discussion, please drop your questions into the chat. We are expecting around 100 people today, and so we may not be able to get to everybody's question. Um, but if you drop it in the chat, we will try to answer it there um, or do a follow-up response. And then we'll move towards closing. We're expected to go until 6.30. The purpose of Phi Alpha Honor Society Omicron Epsilon Chapter here at the University of Southern California is to provide a closer bond among students of social work and promote humanitarian goals and ideals. Phi Alpha fosters high standards of education for social workers and invites into membership those who have attained excellence in scholarship and achievement in social work. Through knowledge, the challenge is to serve. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce uh, the amazing board that I have the opportunity to work with. Uh, my name is Maria Wright. I am a doctor of social work candidate, and I also have my MSW and a BSW. I am the president of the chapter here at USC and the VAC rep for the DSW program. I'd also like to acknowledge the vice president, uh, Shalice, who is also our philanthropic chair, uh, Tanya, who is our secretary, who I believe is here today, Nicole, who is our treasurer, Diana, who is our social media and communications chair, if you're not already following us on Instagram, please do. Diana is amazing. And our advisor of the year for Phi Alpha Nationals, <laughs> um, Dr. Uh, Hashu, and uh, our advisor, thank you so much for all of your work. Our research liaison, we had an amazing research symposium a few weeks ago, uh, and thank you to Kimberly for that. Our membership chair, Lizette, and our recruitment chair, Maddie. I'd also like to acknowledge our VAC MSW representatives, Ariana and Serena, and our fundraising chair, Valet. Now for our mm -hmm. panel discussion. So I want to take a moment to introduce our panel uh, for today. Uh, first, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Judy Silliban. She's been a strong supporter for USC Phi Alpha chapter. She's been our keynote speaker for our graduation induction ceremony. Uh, she's currently an associate professor at USC Suzanne Dual Peck School of Social Work. Her work focuses on the impact on childhood uh, adversity and family process on the well being of youth. And she really focused on her uh, research to explore the strengths and challenges experienced by diverse families and also, uh, you know, positively how they impact the uh, mental health, um, re reproductive health, and substance abuse behavior in children, adolescents, young adults. Professor Silberg served as the immediate past chair of public health social work section of the American Public Health Association and served as the discipline director for two maternity child health funded program at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. So we welcome her today. I would like her to do a quick uh, introduction about herself. I'm sure I missed some of the important what she has. Um, hi, everybody. No, that, that was very kind of you. I think the only other thing I will add is that I um, have a bachelor's degree in behavioral science. And uh, from Drew University, I have a master's in social work from UCLA and I was in health, did a master's in public social work at the University of Pennsylvania. 
Great, awesome. Thank you, Dr. Silaban. And the next panelist I'd like to introduce is Dr. Alamo. Uh, Dr. Alamo is a licensed clinical social worker with her pupil service credential, PPSC, and an associate teaching professor here at USC, Suzanne Dorapak School of Social Work. She holds a Doctor of Behavioral Health from Arizona State University and has over 27 years of professional experience in diverse settings. That's including healthcare, school, K-12 school, public safety, community-based organizations, and also public child welfare. Her career focuses on promoting the wellness, health, and mental health, along with building appropriate infrastructure that support them. Dr. Elamon uh, is also our past USC um, NSW unit uh, chair, um, and also um, her, she also worked with our forensic social work caucus. So Dr. Uh, Elamon is a former director um, and she co-lead um, our social and public safety collaboration here in USC. So I'd like for her to maybe mention a little bit more of her work, Dr. Alamo. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chow. I really appreciate a uh, very thoughtful introduction. I think that just a couple of things to add would be that I, I currently continue to serve as the, the co-chair uh, for the USC NASW unit here on campus as well as the co-chair for our Forensic Social Work Caucus here on campus. Um, I also serve as a forensic expert and consultant on a local and national level on reimagining public safety and uh, really looking at ways of how to integrate the community voice and, and really have the mental health experts in that space to support with the mental health needs, social service needs, of the communities that are being served. Thank you. We welcome you, Dr. Alamo. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Carrie Doyle. She joined our Virtual Academic Center in 2011. Um, she's currently, uh, you know, um, in 2020, Professor um, Doyle co-developed and facilitated a school practicum training. We call it SWIFT program which trains school social worker students in trauma uh, responsive school-based intervention. So from 2015 to 2019, uh, Professor Doyle uh, assists with coordination of the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement Summer Training Program, and then really assist uh, develop of the NCSCB fellowship uh, program. She also mentors and guides school social worker students that reside outside of California. Her DSW doctor research, a qualitative study of school social workers' experiences uh, providing crisis intervention and support after targeted gun violence, examine how MSW education can better prepare school social workers in providing crisis response and trauma intervention after mass gun violence. Um, she's a, site, a licensed independent clinical social worker, uh, has experience in uh, multiple assessment, treatment quality assurance, and she really focused on her trauma um, sensitive mindfulness intervention in the school setting, uh, compassion for T among educators, trauma response intervention. She's also trained in EMDR, hypotherapy, uh, and also is a registered yoga instructor, Dr. Carrie Doyle. Thanks, Dr. Chow. Uh, nothing much to add. As you can see from my bio, my focus is really on trauma, uh, trauma in schools and mass violence. Um, prior to starting my doctorate, I had about 20 years of experience, but throughout those 20 years, my focus was really on trauma in schools. Great. Thank you, Dr. Doyle. Um, the next panelist is uh, Dr. Holly Privy Sotelo, Associate Teaching Professor with Practical Education here at USC Suzanne Doyle Pet School of Social Work. She has a master and a bachelor in rehabilitation services and is a, it's, you know, she just got her doctor in uh, um, 
It's our uh, Price School Puppy Policy. She earned her doctor with a doctor in policy planning and development. So if you're interested in macro, uh, this is a great degree to have. So she'll share more about that. Um, Dr. Sotero also earned a credential with educational administrative services here in California, as long as with pupil service credential. Um, she's very skilled in dispute resolution, conflict resolution, human trafficking, child abuse, and family violence. And she had three decades of practice uh, social social work experience, including direct practice, administration, and macro. So I'm gonna let her introduce herself a bit. Thank you and good evening, uh, Dr. Shao and, and guests. Um, I'm Holly and uh, I don't know much more to add, but I will say that I'm in Roswell, New Mexico today at a conference on human trafficking. And uh, it's a really big deal for the community here in Roswell in that the, this is the first time that this is uh, really addressing human trafficking prevention. And so I'm happy to be a part of that. And so I did want to mention that my MSW is in my master's is in social work I, and my bachelor's is in rehabilitation counseling. I wasn't sure if that was clarified, um, but just happy to be a part of this amazing panel of fast and furious women. So yay, bye Don. Thank you, Dr. Sotelo. And we have our last panelist, Dr. Sarah Calaboso Soto, is an associate teaching professor here in practical education, assistant director for clinical programs here at USC, Susan Doyle Pet School of Social Work. She has worked as a licensed clinical social worker in Los Angeles for over 20 years and provided direct practice to um, children, youth, and family in South LA. She also led the development and implementations of various community based programs including a zero to five assessment, intervention, and intensive program working with the chronic mentally ill and transitional age youth. Uh, Professor uh, Calaboso Soto is a clinic director of our Behavioral Health Clinic here at USC. They provide short-term evidence-based treatment for individuals seeking mental health services. She oversees the clinical uh, operation and the training of MSW intern in her role as a clinical director, Professor um, uh, Calaboso Soto also secured funding for the clinic from FEMA, Monterey County, Behavioral Health, Queens Care, and the California Victim Compensation Board. Um, she earned her Doctor of Education Organizational Change and Leadership. So we welcome her today for our, as our panel. Thank you, Dr. Xiao. I'm honored to be here with my esteemed colleagues and all of you students out there. I don't have much to add um, to the bio. Um, one thing, I'm also the clinic director for our trauma recovery center here at the school as well. Great. Welcome all the panelists. So I think without any further ado, we will just start our uh, questions that we have. Great. Thank you. And just a little bit of housekeeping keeping for those that just joined and welcome. Um, we're going to be doing some pinning and so you'll keep seeing your screen move around. Our intention is to pin the speaker. Um, and so to maintain a larger screen where you have a gallery view, if you go to the top right of your Zoom window, you'll see a little grid box in the word view. You can select that and then go down and select gallery. Um, and you may need to continue to do that as we move pins around. You can also select a different viewpoint if you want to focus your screen in a different way. Um, we will uh, open up for questions at the end of our panel discussion, which will last about a little less than an hour. Um, but if you have questions throughout, please ask your questions in the chat and we'll attempt to respond to those throughout. If not, we will provide a response um, at the end. Thank you. All right. So. Again, my name is Maria Wright, and I will be um, asking uh, a few questions over the next hour to panelists. And as the panelists um, hear the question, um, it, uh, when you're ready, you can um, come off of mute and respond. So the, this first question is for all panelists that are present today. How did you select your advanced degree? Who would like to go first? 
Maybe we can be easy and like do alphabetical or something like this. With rosemary means you're up first. Oh, th th thanks a lot. Uh, <laughs> alphabetical by last name. <laughs> no, no, no. It's all good. It's all good. Thank you. Happy to start us off. Well, for me, I have to tell you, it, it wasn't such an easy process. Um, I really, it was very deliberate. I um, went ahead and did um, a lot of research to find out what, uh, doctoral programs were available and and really I think after I think I had at least 10 years if not more already post MSW that I thought what's going to help me uh, further advance my learning so it was because I had a little I started to have an itch to con to go back to school okay and that's how it went and then from that little itch and here I am um, enrolling or back then enrolling in a doctoral program of behavioral health with ASU and really, it was a program that was able to recognize, uh, my, uh, as an example, myself coming in already with the license um, as a licensed clinical social worker, and then uh, being able to take it to the next level, both on the clinical and management uh, track as well. So it offered me the opportunity to actually work on both um, the clinical and uh, management, you know, and, and enhancing those skills and really building um, the skills so that I can work across uh, on both levels um, on integrating behavioral health programs wherever I would go. Um, and so that's what I loved about it, um, that, that ability to be able to apply across the board, across our settings to include now currently um, in the classes that I teach and then the work that I do day in and day out. Thank you. Thank you so much. We should popcorn to Dr. Silva, right? See? Unless, well, I was think it's Sarah. Oh. A becomes before E, right, Julie? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, um, I I got my doctorate tw after 20 years of practicing um, clinical social work. And um, I, I, I'm still in amazement that I did it and finished it. Um, because if you would have asked me if I would ever go back to school after my master's, I would have told you no. Um, and I still can't believe it to this day that I have a doctorate. I'm very thankful that I do. I um, shopped um, many different disciplines um, from the social, from a doctorate of social work, um, doctorate in policy. And again, with education, I narrowed it down to three. Um, being a licensed clinical social worker in my brain, I thought that I kind of hit the max really of my skills as a clinician. And I really wanted to do something different. I really wanted to learn something very different. And so the educate, the doctor in education was really appealing to me. It um, focused on leadership and fine tuning my leadership skills and bringing change into organizations and learning how to um, uh, uh, manage and lead teams. And that was where I, um, that's where I feel like it, that inspired me to go for the doctorate in education. Um, I feel that it was um, the skills that I learned there have really helped me in the position I am in right now to just expand. And that's what that's what we're doing right now. So I feel um, it's served me very well um, in my capacity. Um, and I'm just about two years out of my um, my doctorate of, of earning my doctorate. So I feel like it was a really perfect move for myself. I may be the lone PhD on the panel. Is that the case? Okay. Um, so, I, you know, a PhD is a very different type of degree. It is uh, research focused. Um, I did work post MSW for uh, several years and uh, there were a few things um, that landed me where um, I did. I think one was a professor in my MSW program telling me that he, he looked forward to me being a colleague one day. I just didn't graduate from an MSW program thinking that's the route I was going. Um, 
but it planted a seed and he for sure was a great mentor over the years. Um, another was, I, you know, I felt really good with the clinical work I was doing, uh, but also that I was hitting a lot of barriers because of systems and structures. Um, and I think in hindsight, uh, I, I was a little frustrated, I think, in the role and wanted to um, think about change making uh, in a different way. And um, and I think last was that there I was the social worker at a housing program um, for HIV infected families, and there was a researcher from UCLA who came to meet with me and um, the director to ask to do recruitment and to run group focus groups kind of at our site. And so I got to sit in and, and kind of learn about it. And I said, I, I want to do that, you know. So um, that's kind of what led me. Um, to a PhD program, I will say that there wasn't at the time uh, very many or any uh, DSW programs. I'm looking at Carrie, uh, you know, Penn was one that we both went to the University of Pennsylvania, was one of the first to bring the DSW back. Um, and, and so I think, that, you know, I'm happy to answer any and all questions, but a very different um, degree. I've graduated 15 years ago, but I'm very research. My job is much more research focused um, with teaching and service as kind of the accompaniment, but research being kind of the core of my job, which is great. If you have like ongoing curiosity and like to keep reading and learning, it's an amazing job. Thank you. And you said you went to UCLA? I did my master's at UCLA and my PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. Okay. Yes, UCLA used to have the DSW, and that's how I once found out about it over a decade ago. So thank you so much. Um, all right, who would like to go next? Uh, I think I'm next in the alphabet. Um, so um, I selected the uh, DSW because I really wanted a balance between practice and research. And similar to what Rosemary and Sarah said, um, I had been practicing for almost 20 years. Um, when I started looking at programs and I was really torn between the um, PsyD and the DSW because I had a particular interest in, in clinical practice and mental health. Uh, so I was going back and forth uh, deciding which those, you know, two degrees I wanted to do. I did, um, I really wanted to go back because I wanted to practice from a more advanced per perspective. I wanted to take the years that I practiced and now I wanted to go back into the classroom um, and learn from professors who had a different perspective, but also from my colleagues as well. So, and I also wanted to reintroduce to research. Uh, I got my MSW over 20 years ago and I last, that was the last time I took a research course because I don't teach research at, at USC. Um, and so I was like, I think I need to reintroduce this to my knowledge base. And so, um, I focused on a, a doctorate, a DSW that had a clinical uh, focus that was small cohort because I knew I wanted a small cohort of students to build those relationships with. And um, I wanted that uh, research component with the dissertation attached to it. Um, so I went the DSW route also rather than the PsyD because I'm a social worker. Um, I wanted that social justice part attached to the clinical practice. Um, and with the PsyD, it didn't offer that. So uh, that's why I selected the DSW. Wonderful. And hello, last but not least here. Uh, so uh, my degree is a practitioner's degree. It's in public policy. And similar to Dr. Xiao, uh, Su Chen and I, we have the same degree. So I was very interested in policy. I'm interested in social justice on a global, kind of a national, global issues. I felt like similar to Sarah. Sarah said, you know, if you would have asked me 20 years ago if I would have ever gone back to school to get my degree, I would say, no way. But what I learned very quickly as I went through the system, I worked in through a, uh, administration in school districts and public school districts. I learned very quickly that if you really want an invitation to the to the table to really make bigger change, you need to have a doctoral degree. And so I felt like I hit a glass ceiling in my career that um, 
that for some reason I felt like I could not advance any further without it. So my interests are, is really macro, is really taking social justice to a whole nother level. And my area of interest is public education and is human trafficking and public child welfare. So kind of, um, kind of breathing life back into bringing our policies to another level where we are, um, uh, adv- you know, really, really taking it to another level to uh, advance policy. So I had, I attended a few um, informational sessions and I knew when I went to the USC Price School informational session that I that was that was where I needed to be. And I was just so honored to be a part of them because they only selected eight people out of like hundreds of candidates. They only selected eight. And I was just so honored to be a part of that eight. So that that's how I chose is I went to the informational sessions. Maria, do you want us to answer the questions in the chat as they come? Because I think I can. Pro- we can probably hit this one pretty fast. Um, this um, is I can't a PhD see the one versus a DSW. I can't see the one in the chat. I'm going to keep going through our uh, agenda, and then we can answer that one at the end. Because uh, I do see that one. If you if you think you can, I I mean I know it's a quick answer, but we're we're on schedule so far. Uh, so we'll keep answering questions, and we'll have uh, time for question and answers at the end. Um, but that one I know is a quick one. Um, so the next question that we're going to ask, um, and this one um, is is only for a couple people. We'll have about two to three panelists respond to this one if you feel um, inclined. During your program, what was your area of focus? Which uh, a handful of you already responded to that, but if you'd like to um, share a little bit more about during your program, what was your area of focus? And you can either, uh, as panelists, raise your hand uh, in the future or just come off of mute when you're ready. Uh, I can jump in. So mine was a clinical program. There's all different types of DSW programs out there with different focus, foci. So I, I it's, a, it's a clinical program I went to because I was interested in trauma um, and, and interventions around trauma and research. Uh, so mine was specifically that mental health clinical focus. Um, I had a dissertation that was funded by a grant from the National Institute of Mental Health, and it was looking at um, uh, parent-child communication around abstinence and safer sex and differences between HIV positive and negative mother-daughter dyads. So heavy research focus. I'm happy to go ahead. I think I mentioned this, this is Holly, that my area of study was really looking at human trafficking prevention education and public school leadership and how leadership is perceiving laws that are implemented. So there are oftentimes lawmakers, they pass laws and then expect public administrators and schools to implement them. But oftentimes there's a disconnect and there's a misinterpretation of how administration are actually implementing those laws. So I did a case study examining how administrators are implementing human trafficking prevention laws. And the findings were very interesting and would be happy to share my dissertation with with anyone who's interested. So thank you. Thank you. Would any, yeah, go ahead, uh, Dr. Alamo. Yes, thank you. Uh, for me, uh, it, it was a clinical concentration that covered both healthcare interventions and management strategies for integrated behavioral health programs. That was the focus for me. I can just finish it up, Maria. So my focus was on leadership and bringing leadership in agencies or um, organizations, as well as leading change within those organizations and change and organizations and agencies. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, our next question for the panelists, what advice do you have for students who are interested in pursuing a doctorate degree? Again, this next question and um, whomever would uh, like to respond, again, um, we welcome all panelists to respond to this. What advice do you have for students who are interested in pursuing a doctorate degree? Whenever you're ready, you can come off of mute. Uh, yeah, I I would just say my guidance would be to know 
why um, you want to doctor it um, because it's a large investment in time and money. Um, so give a lot of thought to, to your why behind why you want to doctor it and then select what type of doctorate you feel would be most helpful um, to your career goals. And as you can see from all of us on the panel, we all have our doctorates, but different focus, whether that be research or more policy or more clinical. So, so take the time um, to ask yourself those questions. I would also I would in, in addition to Carrie because Carrie you Dr. O, you you stole my what I was thinking about um, in addition to that to the why also understanding and doing your research on what doctoral programs are out there so that that will help you as well being able to to speak to students that are in those doctoral programs um, find out what they're experiencing and what they do anything different what got them into it, um, I think is it would be very important. Um, also ensuring that once you're ready, because it's not, not an easy task whatsoever, um, it, ensuring that you have that support system, um, both emotionally and even financial, because it's, it takes a lot of time and effort. I do think this is a good time to pop in and say, well, not all of them. A PhD is generally a funded degree. So this does not have a cost to the student. It, the stipend, uh, there is like tuition coverage and health insurance, et cetera, and generally a stipend. Um, PhDs are also almost exclusively full time. So I think that may be also different. I think many of you did a doctorate kind of during career and potentially while working, um, whereas the PhD is usually a full-time residential, meaning you are going to school where it is the school is and in person. And uh, and again, the structure of funding is is very different. Thank you. Would anyone else like to respond to this one? Any other panelists? I, I, I'll i just say one of the hardest part, parts about um, beginning a doctoral program, my colleagues already said really important things that I was also going to say, but you really need to recognize that this is a huge sacrifice. Your life will be put on hold. Like your friends who are in family, if you're married or have small children, your life is literally on pause because so you can tell everyone in your life, in your circle, I'll see you in a couple of years because, you know, the you start missing birthday parties, vacations, um, and especially if you're working full time and wanting to have a family, there's a huge sacrifice. So you just need to have that support system. So really think about that. It's a huge commitment. I will say if you're not working full time, it's different. <laughs> so I just I mean, like I didn't resonate with what you said. That wasn't my experience, Holly. And I just want to just kind of say that there are multiple ways we have these experiences. My full time job was school. And so it was my career for the six years I did it. And so while everything is a sacrifice, I, I believe that about jobs and everything else. I don't, I think it's very different to do a degree on top of a job in terms of time than it is to be kind of a full-time student. And so I just wanted to throw that as an alternative um, to kind of balance experiences. I appreciate that balance and in, in the different perspectives or experiences. All right. I think we can move on to the next question. All right. Um, so the next question is going to be um, how have you been able to use your doctorate degree to advance your professional career? Again, um, any of the panelists can respond to this one. How have you been able to use your doctorate degree to advance your professional career?
I was going to leave this to my other colleagues, but I will say that a PhD really is like uh, pretty academically focused. So I would say the majority of folks coming out of a PhD program who in the end liked the PhD program go into an academic setting, whether that is uh, while there are different types of jobs, there are more research focused, depending on the type of institution, there are more teaching focused jobs, um, almost six exclusively or a large proportion go into academia, research think tanks. Um, and so I think it, it it's a pretty directed degree. Like if that's the job you want, a PhD is a very direct way to get it, which I think is different than kind of what some of my colleagues will say in terms of how their degrees helped with advancement. Um, if you, and this is back, Oscar, I'm then going to answer your question. This is where like, if you want an, if you want to work agency-based, a DSW Dependent on the degree, the DSW is probably a stronger route to go because the PhD is really setting you up for an academic specific job and is very research heavy and focused. Many of our DSW programs across the country give you very strong research and evaluation skills to use in practice. So I think it's just a different, um, I think it kind of depends on the job you want. Um, but I think the PhD has a narrow, not super narrow, but like a narrow kind of path in terms of what it results in than, than I think some of the DSWs do. And I'd like to add to that. Oh, sorry, Carrie, where are you going to? I'll go add. Yeah. Thank you. And I'd, I love to piggyback on what uh, Dr. Cedarbaum already mentioned in that the PhD is very different from a practitioner's degree in that for me, answering that question of how have I been able to use my degree, I think it had, because I am interested in practice and the application in, in the macro world so far, and again, my degree just confirmed, just confirmed this last month, I've already been invited to, um, uh, speak at this national conference. I've been, a, I've been able to, uh, speak, have, a invitation to address a 45 minute segment on the news about school violence because it addressed areas of interest and it brought more credibility. So I think the invitations from the outside world about our opinion or my opinion about what I think or how I would advise other leaders on how to address violence in the community, et cetera, that doctoral degree gives you that extra layer of credibility, so to speak. And so I believe that with that, a number of invitations have come forward and uh, news have come forward. They're reaching out for expert advice on on various topics. So that's uh, that's one way I've been able to apply it. Um, I think for myself, uh, because I wanted that balance between research and practice and went for the DSW, I really wanted my research to make a, a difference, right? So there comes that social advocacy part of the DSW versus other programs I was looking at, the ID. Um, so my doctoral research focused on crisis response and recovery after mass gun violence in schools. And as we all know, sadly, that is becoming an all too common occurrence in our world. And so since I, uh, since I, um, had my defense a few years ago. I've presented my research findings at multiple conferences. I've had the opportunity to sit on um, gun violence panels. Uh, I co-developed a mental health threat assessment training, and I'm currently working on a book with two colleagues who uh, directly responded to mass gun violence in um, two school shootings that occurred in the U.S. Um, so I I'm trying to take my interest in this subject matter, the research that I did, and hopefully move that forward so there's more policy change um, in our country. Um, I'd like to just echo some of what my colleagues are saying as well. Um, brings a lot of, the doctorate for me has brought a lot of credibility to the work that I do. Um, I do get asked to um, help develop programs, um, particularly in telebehavioral health. Well, as many of you know, that uh, modality is not going away, but lots of agencies are trying to figure out how to navigate, um, how to create these programs. Um, so I do get asked to help with development. Um, um, I get asked to speak on panels 
as well as um, even write. Um, I, I have recently been asked to be a co-editor for a book actually on school social work, but I would be looking, I was over the um, the technology and using technology in school section. So it does open a lot of doors. Um, and because I have a like a, a like a niche specifically in mental health and leadership, um, there's lots of different avenues. I think it's a lot of networking to advance it. But yeah, I feel like that it has. And I, I think for me, um, I would say that it's it's creating the space. A lot of what, what some of our colleagues have mentioned is creating those spaces and opportunities that perhaps might not have been available for for like for myself to be at the table. So for for me, even it's been behavioral health and integrated, you know, care, but it's been across all settings. So not only schools, healthcare. Uh, community, you know, uh, service and nonprofits, but also now public safety and and uh, and looking at how to be able to bring in that voice that will represent mental health as well and and be uh, seen as a credible voice and a voice and um, that can be invited to the table uh, to have these conversations and be able to influence and also educate um, that perhaps might not have been as available before. Thank you all. Thank you all for those responses. Um, the next question I'm going to ask is, what was the most challenging and or the most successful part during your program? So again, you can speak to either or or both, um, but what was the most challenging and most successful part during your program? I can go first. It's the one answer that came to my mind really quick. Um, <laughs> the most challenging and successful was my dissertation. So just doing it, completing it, and defending it. I'm very proud of my dissertation, which was on compassion fatigue among MSW students. Um, I was very, was, you know, it was like my baby. I worked very hard on it and very passionate about the topic. And um, yeah, so at the same time, <laughs> thank you. Sarah, I would agree. The dissertation, I felt like I was running a, uh, a marathon um, and there was moments where I'm like, what am I doing? What am I doing? And then there was moments where sentences were would blend together and I'd have, my office was full of research because I had to print them out because I liked printing the articles out. So my office was full of piles of different articles and, and um, oh, that, that dissertation when it was finished, it was like, okay, I did this. So it was my biggest challenge and, and success. Yeah, I agree, Sarah. No, I love that. I always joke that I gave birth twice during my uh, PhD program. One was to a human child and one was to a dissertation. Um, and now that's fully recorded. But it, no, it really was. It was like that level of an event. It's hard to explain, but it's a big deal. And it's uh, so th that was hard. I also just want to throw in, I think for me, I had a, a, like a fair amount of imposter syndrome. And I think that was a real challenge during the program. At least at the beginning, I had come out of the field as a clinician and I just, you know, I had been out of school for a number of years and I just kind of felt like everybody here seems to know what they're doing and I have no idea what I'm doing or everybody seems, you know, whatever narrative, which was untrue that my brain did. So some good, like, uh, you know, implementation of CBT on myself <laughs> over time. And it took about a year, right, to really just feel kind of grounded, Um and I will say it started, it, I felt it again the first year I was in the job, right? Because it was also like a big transition into an academic job um, and kind of you move from being a learner to being the expert, but other, only because someone like anointed you that you had passed a dissertation, right? So I think that there is definitely like several um times, right? So there's like this kind of beginning part of just situating myself. Who am I now? What does this mean? How do I see myself? how do I maybe stop trying to compare myself to others and then kind of feeling settled in for, for a period of time and accomplishing these like really important goals. And then kind of, again, the transition, if you move out of that into a new job of, you know, kind of reestablishing again. So uh, I think for sure with a PhD, 
there are a number of milestones and you have to keep kind of climbing, right? You did the dissertation and then you need to get tenure and then you want to be promoted to full professor, right? There's like several steps. And so this doesn't just happen once. And I think that that's also important. It's that, um, you know, this is a great conduit to get you to wherever that next place is, but that next place is not the end. And so recognize that you will work again, you will stumble again, you will have challenges again, and you will overcome those again and have another milestone to celebrate. I have to say for me, in addition to the dissertation, because it made me wonder what the heck did I get myself into? Like, do I really want this? Do I need this? And, am I, and at times I would say, no, I don't. I'm licensed. I don't need this. Nobody's asking me for it. But it was just me, right? So, um, but in addition to the dissertation, I have to say the internship. I had to do almost 300 hours of an internship while in school um, doing the doctoral program and while working. And let me tell you, that was a heck of a job. Um, so I had, I did my internship at Cedar sinai in the primary care, uh, one of the primary care clinics. And my uh, supervisor was an MD uh, who was amazing and, and just an amazing individual, very supportive and I learned so much. But let me tell you, I, that internship is that the one that made me think about it even 10 times more, like how in the heck am I gonna get this done? given this and I need that um, internship in order to be able to move forward with my dissertation because it was going to be based on um, my my work you know at the clinic so yes that was that that was it for me <laughs> wonderful and I have to really ditto everything that my colleagues have already shared the dissertation is really is monumental. It's bigger than life. And um, for me, I also had a, a little bit of imposter syndrome where I felt like I'm not a really good writer. What am I doing? This is impossible. And so I really kind of second guess myself like can I really do this and, and like Rosemary it's like do I really need this to to get ahead and um so the dissertation definitely was the hardest but there was another part of it that was also very challenging and that was my personal life you you I feel really guilty when my my family you know guilty that I couldn't be there for my family um so it was very challenging because they couldn't while they were very supportive, they couldn't quite understand why I was waking up at three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning to write because I was working full time. And so, um, you know, just finding little kernels, golden moments in the evening or early in the morning when the family's still sleeping to write. And that was the most the hardest part was getting it done getting out of my own way to say, you know what, I am a good writer. I, I can do this too. So um, anyway, if you got the right mindset, you can do anything. Thank you. Actually, my family and friends made it a verb. So they said, oh, she can't go. She's dissertating. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. Advisor, did you want to speak to this as well? No, advisor, don't be shy. I echo everything they said. I agree <laughs> totally, 100%. Yes, I do as well. <laughs> um, okay, so um, the uh, the last question I wanted to ask um, is, um, if you could select a professional degree again, would you go the same route? Would you select the same one that you selected if you could do it again? Or is there another professional degree that you um, now see might be more of an interest or more beneficial? I'll just say, I'm super cool. happy. To, uh, no, I was just really happy with my choice. I, you know, I always like in an, in my next life, I would love to be a librarian, right? I mean, there's like 10 million things I can think that I would love to do, but that doesn't me not do this again. I, like, I really like my job. And I think, again, I think you want a degree that's going to help you get to the job that you want. Um, and that matches like your, what you're passionate about, what you like to do. Um, for me, it's just like chronic curiosity. So I really like the, the, a job where my job is to learn all the time and learn new things and learn from others. And 
um, I like the balance of kind of research and teaching and, you know, doing service in, in community and, and partnerships with community agencies, et cetera. So uh, absolutely no regrets. I'll just say for myself, I, no regrets. I found what I love and I'm doing it. And, uh, but if I had another life, I would probably um, sell balloons at the beach or something or be a flower decorator. I don't know, but um, yeah, balloons and flowers, maybe a, a dog sitter or something. I don't know, but I love my degree and I love what I'm doing. I'll just echo my colleagues. I, I love the degree. Um, I, I don't regret any of the time that I spent on it. And uh, I really love my job and I love what I do. So no regrets. Yeah. Same here. Ditto on all of that. I think if I had the opportunity for another job, it would be like dog groomer. I think that's what I would love to do. Yes. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, for me, I would do it again. Um, if I always say if I had more time, um, I would say law. That was that's my other passion, law. Amazing. Thank you all for responding to our questions that we have. Um, I did see a question in the chat that I don't believe has been answered in your responses. Um, if if someone can please provide more insight on a doctoral degree in education and what that looks like. Sure, I can do that. Um, so I, I received my doctorate at Rossier at uh, USC and they have lots of different, um, kind of, I would say like tracks in the doctorate of education. Um, when I was doing my research, I, that, a doctorate education was the furthest thing from my mind. I really thought that that um, was for like um, elementary school or high school um, and, and leadership and working within like the school system. And um, when I, you know, dove more into the, to, to the research of, of finding the doctoral program, they have lots of different ones, uh, uh, lots of different doctorates in education, including um one specifically for high school or high school administration. They have others like um, um, global like education. And also, which again was mine was organizational change and leadership. Um, so, and I did, I did research at like Pepperdine too. They had similar sorts of tracks. Um, but I think the doctor in education has just different focus from leadership to education. Um, elementary school education, high school education, and, and things like that. So um, I can't emphasize enough to do the research and to see what what um, what appeals to you, what you like, um, because I would not have thought the doctorate of education would have been the route I took either. I hope that answers your question. Liz, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. All right, um, so we're going to now move it to our uh, question and answer session. If you are uh, an attendee here today and you have a question, um, if you are comfortable coming off of mute, please use the raised hand feature and we'll call upon you. Your raised hand feature is under your reaction, which you can find on the toolbar on the bottom of your Zoom screen. I uh, will call in order of hands raised. And then if you do not feel comfortable coming off of mute, but still have a question, please drop it in the chat. You can either send that question to um, everyone or you can send it directly to me. All right, we will start with Oscar. Hi, you guys. My name is Oscar Chavez and I am interested in applying to uh, DSW programs this year, hopefully. Um, I do have a question in regards to like accreditation. I keep reading that um the DSW program is not accredited by the CSWE, so I just wanted to ask if that, you know, matters, if it makes a difference, or what is your opinion on that? Um, Oscar, I can just speak to my experience back when I attended my DSW program. So um, you're, you're correct, there was no accreditation at the time. 
Um, we specifically, I went to the University of Pennsylvania and we specifically asked that question. And at the time, it was a few years ago, they weren't pursuing it, but what I was told was not many schools were. However, I think that has changed and I think more and more schools might be um, pursuing accreditation. Um, so that's my best answer for you. At the time, it wasn't a concern for me um, because of how I wanted to use my DSW. So I had my MSW for licensure, right? But I wanted to use my DSW for more of a balance between research um, and education and practice. Thank yeah. you. I'm going to hop on there and just say, I'm not, you know, we accredit MSW programs because of licensure and you're, that's not the result of the DSW. And so I, I'm just echoing kind of what Carrie's saying. It's not that it's not valid and important in CSW having some oversight, but, but there is no two DSW programs that look the same. So it's, it's very different than the uh, MSW, which has standards that, and competencies that need to be specifically met. So I think it, it, it's kind of, it's a, it's just a different, um, kind of outcome and therefore the oversighting body, I think is less, um, I don't want to say less relevant, but, you know, kind of less, it's, um, uh, less required, um, because there's no licensure at the end of it. Thank you. Um, great questions. I uh, appreciate those questions, Oscar. Um, we have uh, another hand, Rose, and then we will move into um, the ones I see in the chat. Um, Raymond? Hello. I'm driving, so I'll do the best I can. First of all, thank you so very much for answering all the questions. You had. Um, Raymond, it's okay to be off of video. If you're driving, please focus on the road. Perfect. Thank Got you. it. Okay, yeah. So my question is that I'm gonna I'm thinking of applying for a PhD in the fall of 2025, um, while also working on licensure in my in during the summertime. Um, wanted to see if that's something you guys would recommend, or if you know anybody that has done that, or I guess traditionally it's you get your license first and then, or you know you do one then the other, not both at the same time. Yeah, I'm gonna take that one. Um, so one of the things I really want to kind of say very, very clearly is that CSWE requires at least two years of postmaster's practice experience to teach a significant number of classes in a MSW program. So I recommend to everybody to work at least two years post MSW before going into a PhD program. Uh, PhD programs are full-time they, uh, they're research intensive and generally your summers are doing research. So um, most of them, because their stipend do not allow you to work during the nine month period where you're getting a stipend because that money is to work as a research assistant, et cetera. Um, and the other part of your time is meant to be in the classroom. So it's 50% classroom, 50% research hours or teaching assistantship. And so while it is not impossible, I did have a few friends that uh, were dual degree students when they went to Penn. And so they did things like one day a week for like six years to accrue hours, right? Like it's, it's just not, uh, but you are not likely to have big chunks of time um, in the way that you do before entering a full-time PhD program. I hope that didn't burst anybody's bubble, but <laughs> I, um, I mean, no, I, I, I speak to that as well. I, as mentioned, I'm a doctoral candidate. I actually uh, defend here in a few hours. Um, and so, you know, I, I tell and my MSW students are on the call today. I have a handful here and they know um, that there is so much that you can do with your MSW. I tell them that um, as many times as I can, um, your MSW degree will take you very far um, there's a lot of opportunities with it. Um, it is almost a limitless degree and you can get your LCSW. So um, enjoy, enjoy that MSW degree that you are working towards and that you are earning um, because it is a very prestigious and it is a professional degree that you are obtaining. So enjoy that time with it. All right, we're going to move into questions in the chat. 
And if you have a question and you'd like to raise your hand, please do. I'm going to take these two in the chat and then I'll come back to see if there's hands rose. Um, all right, panelists, here we go. We're going to start with Megan's question. I've noticed that the DSW program at USC requires five years work post MSW. As someone who has worked in um, a and, um, alcohol and drugs, um, A&D for 13 years and recently founded a nonprofit, I don't want to have that gap. Is the five-year gap typical for most doctorate programs? Is there a better route to go straight into a program? Um, is I am looking uh, to stay in a nonprofit leadership? Who would like to respond? I can say my DSW program was five years as well. I, I suspect that is typical for DSW programs because they're a practice degree and they want to make sure that you have some years of practice before you go into the degree. Um, so that was similar with the requirements for my program. Would any other panelists like to respond to that question? Just that I think working as a as an MSW, as much as your experience is like incredibly valuable, is is different. The role you're given is different. Um, the responsibilities are going to be a little bit different. And so I think in the work that you're doing towards your nonprofit and and it, my guess expanding it over time, that all of those uh, skills and all of that experience is going to be really critical to it. Um, I think to all of you kind of not going straight into it, right? There's you, because again, you don't yet have enough of the experience post MSW for the DSW. If you go pretty quickly in to be bumped up where the DSW will bump you up over time, which is going to be the match of the, the experience and the education. I think that's a re really good point, right? The bump up. And if you bump up too soon, well, when will you be able to bump up again? This is a terminal degree. There's no bumping after that. And so enjoy the longevity of your MSW and where it can take you and when it's appropriate in your professional, uh, you know, stature of growth to then bump up again with a doctoral degree. And at that point, it would be something specific to the area that you want to focus. Next question from the chat. And I see your hand, Oscar. I'll take you after this one. Um, can you speak to, and we're taking uh, Rosalind's question, can you speak to how you maintained balance between student life and relationship family life? I'll go. Mine was very different. So I, I'll go first because it's just different. Um, so I was married at the time I started a PhD program. We moved across the country from Los Angeles to Philadelphia um, I made sure that we had dinner together every night, right? And if I needed to do studying after, then I did studying after, but we kind of like had protective time and space. Um, also I made sure I didn't work both days of the weekend. I kind of, right. So we had like a fun day and then if I needed to do work and that was really the, to be honest with you, the first two, three years of a PhD program is intensive coursework wise. And then that eases up a lot. Um, then when I had a child, I was, I had a lot of flexibility. I had my own grant, but, um, I, you know, I worked from nine to five or eight to eight 30 to five, whenever I had childcare. And, and I did not work after that. Cause I had an infant and toddler and then a toddler. Right. So I think sometimes your life boundaries itself, right. <laughs> like your time, but you, what I think I learned is to be very efficient when I, cause I knew I was, I had only so much time. And so, I was just really focused um, during that time. And I that is actually a skill that I'm so glad I learned then because it has helped, I think, throughout my career in terms of finding that work-life balance. Harry, were you going to add something to? Uh, no, just efficiency-wise to echo what Julie said, um, you have to be really deliberate with your time. I'm not sure I was wonderful at the balance, to be honest. I don't think I was wonderful, but... I, I, it forced me to be, to be creative. So there was a significant amount of reading in my program. Um, and so I actually, our cohort hired somebody to read the readings into digital recordings. And so I would walk and listen to the readings and get my exercise at the same time. Um, so being efficient, being creative. I also want to add that for me, um, I'm just really, really determined. I really, I'm very disciplined. And so I will say, I'm going to get up at three 
and I'll get up at three and at, at five o'clock I'll stop and I'll switch wherever I am. I'm going to do something different. So I was really disciplined in, with my time. Um, also like Julie though, I, I uh, too made sure that at five o'clock on certain days, it's my family time. Uh, but I do want to say I, I did neglect my health because there were moments when I felt like my arm, my blood pressure was going up. I wasn't really exercising. Um, there was times that I found myself in urgent care in the emergency room just because my arm was going to sleep a lot. Um, and it was because I was sitting. I was sitting and not exercising. So just make sure that you exercise, get out of the chair, move around. So um, so that's also something you just have to make sure you physically get up and move around. Thank you. Oh, I can go. Um, so the question is how you maintain balance. I like Carrie, I don't think I maintained it very well. Tried to be as organized as I could. Like I only took classes on certain days and um, carved out certain days to study and write papers. And that was it. Um, that was the only time I could do it. And I had to make use of that time when you're working full time. And when you're in a leadership role, um, it's not just a 40 hour week. It might be a 50 hour week that week. And something's going to um, not happen that week. And accepting that um, and being okay with that, learning to delegate. <laughs> um, uh, chores around the house was also something that needed to happen. But um, like probably many of you who are have very high expectations, maybe even might've called yourself perfectionists at one time during your career, when you go to doctoral school, you gotta let that go really quick. <laughs> Nothing's going to get done. You're not perfect when you're holding down a job uh, in doctoral school or PhD school and maintaining a full-time job. The perfection has to be let go somewhere. So I had to learn that. Um, that was kind of tough, um, but you learn it. And then you learn that you don't have to be perfect and you can still have a very fulfilling life. So, you know, that's what I <laughs> my colleagues are grinning at me, but yeah, they all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, I, and I would just add that, you know what, you know yourselves better than anyone else. You are the expert of you, okay? You are hearing what, you know, some of our strategies, what worked for us, what didn't, but you know what, you know yourselves better than anyone else. You know your limits, your body, I'm sure will tell you, because it did with me as well. And, 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 and just again, the intentional piece of it. And if you need, um, you know, whether the, if you're doing something with another colleague um, in the program or whatever it is that you're doing, you know, that you can support each other, that you can keep each other accountable or, you know, whomever it is, because sometimes it can be just nonstop. Um, so even if you have to write it down in your agenda, your calendar, um, the end, whatever it is, that's it. Um, again, you know yourselves better than anyone else. Listen to your bodies. Um, they will tell you. Thank you for all the responses. Again, if you have any questions, and I'm going to call on Oscar next. If you have any, any questions, please drop them in the chat or use the raise hand feature. We're in our question uh, phase now for, for anyone in the, um, any participants can ask a question now. Oscar, when you're ready. Thank you. So I just wanted to go back to Megan's question in regards to the five-year requirement for the DSW. So let's say I'm still in the program this year and next year. If I wanted to apply this fall semester for that DSW program at USC, does that mean that I would not even be considered because I don't have the post five year requirement or is it like case by case? Oscar, are you asking specifically about the USC program? Yeah. Yeah, the USC DSW program. I, I'm not sure the answer to that. Yeah, I don't know that any of us are, but it doesn't, if it says required, it's required. If it says recommended, that would be case by case basis. Okay, thank you. I, you I know we have one panelist that didn't join us today, Dr. Jennifer Lewis, and she's our director for DSW program. 
um, happy to share her email contact if you'd like to ask more specific about DSW here at USC. And Oscar, I would also invite you. I'm a DSW student ambassador for the University of Southern California, and we hold informational sessions for students like you that are interested in our program. Um, and we answer those type of questions and the appropriate people to answer those questions are at those informational sessions. Um, you can find them on the website and um, uh, when the next one is and we hold them um, on a like quarterly semester basis. And so I would invite you to um, contact uh, the people that operate those because they would be able to answer those questions um, because they're very specific. All right. Does that wrap up yours, uh, yours, Oscar? Okay, you're welcome to come back when you're ready. Um, if you have another one, um, Tamahana. Hi, y'all. Um, Tamana. Um, so I have a question. So is it better once I have my MSW because I'm graduating this summer? So it's better for me to wait and get my license, work two, three years, and then apply for PhD. Uh, so the, MS, yeah yeah so the phd does not require you to be licensed so because it's an academic kind of research-based job and csw requirement is at least two years post master's experience whether or not you're licensed so it's it's about the time that you had post msw in the field versus whether or not you ever chose to be licensed so i was there more than three years i'm not licensed right so um it's it because it has a different it, but I teach practice just so we're all clear because I meet the requirements for CSWB. So I whereas I think for the DSW the license is much more relevant for the type of degree it is, and so I think more commonly they're going to see folks with license, and then later you know and then get, so I think it's uh, a PhD is not a requirement, but I highly highly recommend the two years post masters, and that's not because you can't get in without it but it's very hard on the job market after you're done if you don't have at least that much experience. And that's because we want you, we want to know that you know how the systems work, how the job works, right? It's hard to teach in an MSW program if you haven't done the job. And so it's kind of enough time in the job to and enough variation in the way that you did the job so that you can come back in um, both as a scholar to understand problems and system. My dissertation was directly driven by the clinical work I did. Absolutely. Like they're like, and I would not have had that if I hadn't worked. Right. So it, it does, it's really kind of important for you to, to help you define kind of what it is that you want to focus on when you're doing research. And I think this is important too, for those of you who might be thinking about a PhD uh, in the application process, schools are looking for students that have a match to topic areas of faculty. And so it, it's very different than the DSW. And so you could be the best candidate on the planet. You could have the most amazing background. Um, and let's say your area of interest is in school violence. If we don't have a tenure line faculty at the school who does school violence work or who can support school violence work, that school is not letting you in. And not because you're not fantastic, but because the mentor student match is critical to the training and research. And critical to you as a learner having the opportunities to do research in your area of interest. And so I'm happy to drop my uh, information into the chat and answer any questions even after this. But I do think kind of the PhD, very different process um, in the app for the application, but also in the review. Um, and very atypical, I say this very specifically, schools do not hire their own students. And it's very hard to get a job within your own city. And so you have to kind of, if you want to do this job and get an academic position, or if you want to do this degree and get an academic position, you kind of have to be open um, to going to where the job is. And that's, I think, also very different between a PhD um, and the DSW, where a lot of my colleagues had a very important roles in established careers here, got this degree and elevated their careers. Um, whereas I was in Pennsylvania, got a job in Los Angeles, right? Like it, like it's, and that is a very typical, um, experience. Thank you so much.
All right. Amazing questions. Are there any questions we have time for? Maybe um, maybe one or two more questions. Any other questions? I don't see any in the chat. I believe we answered all the questions in the chat. Um, okay. Can you be a professor with a DSW? Yes, but <laughs> I'm Julie, you can chime in on this. So yes, um, I am. Um, and you can usually be a professor in practicum, which I am, but also in more teaching lines. Um, it is, from what I have been told, it's very difficult to get a tenure line teaching position at a um, research-driven un uh, university. So it's not unheard of of a DSW to get a tenure line position, but it's usually not from a university that is, Julie, what's the categories? Tier one, tier it's R, yeah, R1, like research level one, R, yeah, R1 or R2, there's not going to be a tenure line. If you want to be on the tenure track, um, a DSW will not generally get you there. And that's because, uh, not because there's not good training in research, but it wasn't a research focused degree. And those jobs are research focused as the primary part of your job. And it's not, I, I think also, and I don't know my colleagues can say, it may not be a one for one, right? Like, I don't think you can leave a DSW program and expect to go into an academic position. No. Yeah. I and did that's also, not, yeah, that's sorry. not the track. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> no, there was a question about whether MSW students can do research and publish um, that I would be happy to answer. So I think that uh, there are a lot of, M I've worked with a lot, almost every semester, there's MSW students that are on publications with me, do research on my projects and publish. So the answer is yes. It's, it's. Um, I think it's probably atypical for you to do it independently, just because you have to learn the skill set to do it. Um, but, um, and research requires an IRB and other things that you might not have the time to, to undertake without kind of a faculty as a mentor. And even to get an IRB through a university, you have to have a faculty sponsor on it. So, um, I highly recommend kind of touching base with faculty, particularly tenure line faculty who have projects in your area of interest, um, to seek out those opportunities. You can do, Su Chen's going to tell me, but there is a 590. There is like an independent study that you could choose as an elective and you can do research with the faculty um, using that independent study slot. Or you can just do it because you want to. Thank you so much. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Yes, thank you for uh, following up on that question as well. Are there any other questions that I missed in the chat? I know I get a lot of questions from the student MSW. Um, they want to know if they're applying for a PhD program, what type of criteria or qualifications or how can they best prepare for their application to be considered? So I don't know if you can answer that question. Um, sure. I would say that you want to stay connected to faculty from your MSW program. You're going to need them for letters of recommendation and you are gonna want them to know you. So the best that you can kind of either in, as a student in the classroom, be an active participant or connect with them to do some type of research. Um, a lot of programs really want uh, applicants to have some amount of research, like some exposure to research. And so that's again, where I've uh, had a lot of students, even if they don't know, just kind of work with me on something so that like they'll end up with a publication or you know on a conference presentation that kind of shows that they were engaged in research so i think that while you're in an msw program it's great to do i have a student now who grad i had someone now that graduated last june but she knows that's ultimately her path and so she's reconnected with me she met with me before she graduated but then reconnected with me this spring and is working on a project doing uh, analyzing coding data with me because she really wants again to kind of build that for the future again mentor and match fit so there's got to be when you write a phd application you're going to name people that you want to work with right so there has to be kind of a fit um and that person has to want to take students and that part you can't <laughs> you can't control but what you can do is reach out and say hey i'm pursuing or I'm interested or I'll be applying for a PhD program wondering if I can talk to you about your research right so faculty tend to be pretty receptive and if they're not I would say that's a great signal of how they might be as a mentor so it's something to consider um and then I think a really kind of thoughtful and directive essay which is different than the type you would write for an MSW program it really is about 
kind of who you are and why you want to do what you want to do, kind of what led you to it, but also what it is that you specifically want to study. So we don't want you to be so specific that you're like, I either want to do this or nothing, but rather that you have a very defined area of interest. Um, I think applicants who are kind of diffuse and are like, I like these three different things. I'd be happy anywhere. Um, have a much harder time getting in than those who have a very clear focus. So the, and any faculty should help you with that, with your statement. Do not write a statement and not have people read it. I don't care if it's your friends, your mom, definitely faculty member, right? This is not something you should necessarily know how to do without the support of somebody who's done it. Um, it's not like a magical thing that people just know how to do. So um, I would say don't hesitate to reach out and ask for support in the process um, because the best way in is to get mentored through the process. That's a wonderful advice. I, I really appreciate it, um, Dr. Silvan. A lot of course students ask the same question. So thank you. Great. Well, I don't see any other question. Oh, let me check the chat. Someone's popping up. Okay. I don't see any other questions and I don't see any um hands rose. Um, if so, Professor, would you mind pulling the slide deck back up and we'll move towards closing? Yes, hold on. And so once again, uh, today's panel is sponsored by um, our chapter here at USC, Phi Alpha. Um, please do follow our Instagram page for more updates. You can um, pull up the QR code now from the screen or just follow us at USC Phi Alpha Honor Society. Uh, we are very active online. You can also find out more about our Honor Society uh, through our website. If you are not a member um, but are interested in becoming a member of Phi Alpha, please consider reaching out to us. You can send us an email um, and our email is on the screen as well. I wanna thank you for your membership. If you are a member with Phi Alpha, um, thank you for your membership with Phi Alpha Honor Society. And thank you for so many uh, members uh, throughout National that have come uh, to support this panel today. Um, this was uh, something that we were very excited to be able to offer and we thank you for your time. I want to thank the panelists and I'll also pass that to advisor to close out the thank you for panels. So we have a really powerful, impactful uh, panel list today. So I want to take a moment to give them some love. If you want to show them some love, that would be awesome. They are awesome and they're great colleague. And I just appreciate everyone, their contribution to the science. And then also I know uh, they'll be willing to come back, hopefully. Um, I know we have a lot of the students that couldn't make it today. So we'll send out the recording and then um, Hopefully, uh, we can share their email addresses as well. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to them. I think one thing I forgot to ask Dr. Silabang is, is there any faculty, tenure track faculty that's willing to mentor our MSW student? I know a lot of those students keep asking, oh, who do I reach out and how would I approach the tenure track to be my mentor? So that's something that they, they are probably really interested. Who else on our, our tenure track faculty that's willing to kind of mentor the MSW students? I think most people are. I, I, I honestly do. I think it's really about topic fit. So you want to look at what those faculty are doing. If you go to the USC website and look at faculty, you can filter by tenure track. So you don't have to look through every single person. But, uh, you know, if you're interested in substance use, John Clapp's the right person to talk to. If you're interested in kind of LGBT health and suicide, John Blossom is the right person. Right? So there's different people doing different things. And I think you just reach out to them directly. Um, and see if there are opportunities that they have. I, I think that most of us work, sometimes it's easier um, when we are your instructor in the classroom, right? So you know, you get to know us, I think it's easier to approach us, but I, I would say that the majority of people are happy with a cold email <laughs> and will be responsive. Can't say yes to everybody, but, um, and if you need some nudging, I'm happy to nudge on your behalf. So just let me know. Yes. I would um I would support that the university that you're interested in most likely has a faculty page um study that page see what faculty is there see if the faculty that are there align with the interests that you have um and then reach out to them 
Um, and because I am a Trojan, um, the faculty page for USC, uh, Susan Peck is very well detailed um, with all of the professors and staff that are there. So um, you uh, are in luck there because we, um, that we have that opportunity to see who's there and what research they're doing and what their focuses are. Um, several emails have been dropped into the chat. So um, if you'd like any of the panelists emails or emails are in the chat, um, and my email is also in the chat. Um, I also dropped the link to our website in the chat for Phi Alpha if you are interested in joining. Um, uh, if you're a USC student, um, you can click there. If you're a student um, uh, in another area, you can look at our national website to find out who is a part of your chapter. Also just wanna shout out uh, Phi Alpha UMass uh, Global uh, and the VP uh, Renee for joining us today. Mm. There is a quick question for Dr. Sim about. Uh... Yeah, so the tenure track and tenures uh, is we are the faculty hired by the university that are research focused, right? So the, at USC in social work, they're a tenure, we call it tenure line faculty. And tenure is something that after, so we get a review at three years and promoted past that if we have accomplished in the areas of research, teaching, and service. And then at five years and um, if you are tenured, it is the same as you would think of like a teacher in an elementary school being tenured, right? It's it's kind of a job for life unless you do egregious things. And so um, this is so it is not um, it is not contract based. It's kind of a permanent uh, job within the university. So, but again, it's very uh, specific to kind of a reach research track. Um, in a job. And so the reason it's not that many of my colleagues with doctorates and in the teaching line and in the practicum line are doing research. It's just that that might not be the primary aim of their job, whereas the primary aim of my job and how I do well in my, you know, reviews, et cetera, are, um, are to focus on research. And so oftentimes we have more active projects, but also our time, we have more time committed uh, to that. But that was a good question and probably one we should not have assumed people knew. Right. Yes, that asking was it. a good question. Thank you, Renee, for asking that. Mm -hmm. So we're sharp at 6.30. So I want to thank again for all the panelists. And so thank you for all the student future Trojan right there. In, uh, with, uh, Tama. So thank you, everyone, for joining our event today. We look forward to sending you the, um, the recording. And we look forward to for you to join us. Yeah, and hopefully see you at graduation. Yes, for sure. Fight on. Fight on. <laughs> Fight on, Trojans.